Hey, I'm Scott Jones from Emails, and you're listening to Real Food for Real Life. On this episode, I talk with two of our Emails RDs, Andrea Kirkland and Mary Creel. In this first ever chat with our Emails RDs, I have Andrea and Mary answer some of our subscribers' most frequently asked questions, like how do you spot added sugars in foods? Uh, What's the difference between a low carb and a ketogenic diet? And can you lose weight on a paleo diet or low carb diet? Mary and Andrea also share other nutrition tips that'll help you achieve your health goals. Now, before we get to the interview, I have a few housekeeping items. First, send us your questions and comments. We read all of them. And if you have a suggestion for a future guest or a potential topic, I'd love to know that too. You can find us on Twitter, at emails, using the hashtag AskEmails. We also have an email address. It's community at emails.com. If you don't already subscribe to our podcast, subscribe today. It's simple to do. You can find us at itunes.com backslash podcast backslash real food for real life. And while you're there, leave us a review. And finally, if you'd like more information on emails and our variety of meal plan food styles, you can find us at emails.com. Try any of our meal plans free for two weeks, be it paleo, clean eating, or gluten-free. You can even have your shopping list sent directly to Walmart pickup at no charge so your groceries are waiting for you. That's it. On with the show. I want to welcome to the show today our first ever chat with our two emails RDs, rock stars here, um, Andrea Kirkland, Mary Creel. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. It's great to be here, Scott. I am, have so many questions that I want to um, throw out, and most of these are um, things that uh, we either hear through Facebook or through our customer success um, team or, um, you know, just emails that we get. And they're, they're things that um, people are curious about. And it's the kind of topics that the two of you, both being food professionals and having that RD background, I think you have a certain insight into um, not only the, the science behind it, but also like the real applications for uh, regular home cook. So the first thing I want to ask is this whole idea of sugar. We hear a lot about sugar. Um, we know that some of the way that sugars are labeled um, on food packages is changing. So um, I guess, Andrea, and I would ask you, we all know that we should eat less sugar, but you know, I think we know the places that um, sugar is, is obvious, but where are the sugars hidden in things that we might think of as healthy um, that we might want to keep an eye out for? You know, sugar plays a very interesting role in the manufacturing process. It's used um, not only as a sweetener like most of us would anticipate, but Mm -hmm. it's sometimes used as a preservative. Sometimes it's used in baking products. Um, So, again, like you mentioned, it's in a lot of places that we wouldn't expect. And some of the places that it's hiding out the most are things like marinara, um, really? Yeah, marinara. It's there. Not and not all. Not all products. There are some that you can buy on the market now that are more natural. But a mm-hmm. lot of times they'll be added just to enhance the flavor. Right. So and not necessarily for sweetness, but just to kind of just you know make it taste better. Make it taste better. Absolutely. Right. Um, so we wouldn't necessarily pres- um, uh, recognize it as sweet. We would just recognize it as oh, this tastes like the way that mom made it. Maybe. Right. Right. It just it just helps balance the flavor. Right. Um, also. Places that people might not expect to see would be in salad dressings, marinades. Um, One of the most unexpected places is actually in foods that we tend to think that are really, really healthy, which is whole grain bread. Whole grain bread. Whole grain bread. Mm -hmm. Um, And other baked products, cereals. You know, a lot of times you'll even see it in yogurts. You know, it's always better to get the kind that aren't sweet. And even the sweet, even the yogurts that have fresh fruit, Mm -hmm. those will also have added sugars as well. Again, to enhance that sweet flavor of the Okay, fruit. so for all of the people that are listening right now thinking that the idea of unsweetened yogurt sounds kind of gross, what are your recommendations for making it a little bit sweeter but not 
Are there ways to add sweetness to it so you're in control of it versus some of the added sugar that the manufacturer might put in? Yes, I, I would recommend, I think actually it's better to sweeten it yourself because you can still improve the flavor. And mm-hmm. actually, if you use things like honey or molasses, it has... Um, it just kind of gives it a little bit of a different and unique flavor. Right. But again, you a little bit goes a long way. You'd be surprised what a teaspoon of honey would do to some unsweetened Greek yogurt. Right. And if it and if you also get like a Greek yogurt that has a lot of creamy um, fat that um, or healthy fat, or even if it's like the it's the thicker you know the thicker variety. If you go yeah. with the lower fat version, it just it just will help that just a little bit of sweetness will really bring out the the richness and make it really delightful. Yeah, that's a great idea. Now, Mary, I know you've been um, on a gluten-free diet for more than a decade, right? Correct. Yeah? My, um, I have a relative who was diagnosed with celiac disease, mm-hmm. uh, and so I was tested and was not um, diagnosed with celiac disease, but out of solidarity and yeah. just out of curiosity, I yeah. decided, well, I'm going to try to go gluten-free. Well, a decade ago, the products that were available were very limited, and um, it was it was hard going into a restaurant or going shopping and mm-hmm. finding products and, and, and kind of, you know, zigzagging around that whole gluten-free um, aisle, but um, things have really changed in the last decade, and uh, I can eat gluten-free pretty much anywhere, yeah. and it's not difficult. Yeah. And, and I don't have to necessarily resort to all gluten-free products. I think the healthiest way to go gluten-free is just to eat whole foods. Right. Uh, you don't have to buy special products. In fact, many of them are so much more expensive than their counterparts. Um, breads and cookies and, and crackers and pretzels, a lot of things that, um, that people like to snack on mm-hmm. are m- much more expensive. But yeah. if you go for whole foods like nuts or fruits or yogurts that are naturally gluten-free, uh, you don't have to you know, bust your budget. Right, right. And for those people who do um, use a lot of gluten-free pre-made or pre-packaged products, Going back to this idea of sugar, are, are, are there pitfalls in those products that they need to be looking for? Um, I mean, I guess, I guess the question I want to ask is many people might perceive that, oh, because it's a gluten-free this or that. Um, is there also added sugar to that that they should be aware of? That's right. There yeah. seems to be a health halo over gluten-free products, and people think just because it's gluten-free, it's yeah. better for me. But actually, there there are a lot of additives additives used to um, improve the texture and the yeah. flavor of a lot of gluten-free products. I see. So, so um, where there's no of that gluten protein, they're adding things like sugar and sugar fat and to fats. give it texture and right right so i'm a big advocate of reading labels and yeah. just um, being aware of what is is actually in the product and uh, like take for instance um, a gluten free bread uh, a one a one slice might have the same number of calories as say a, a slice of whole grain bread but it's much smaller and it's but and it's denser so you yeah. almost need two slices to give you the same to make a sandwich yeah that you would would only need one slice of regular bread yeah yeah well you bring up a um a great segue into what the next thing i wanted to ask which is about food labels whether it's gluten-free or just a regular product that you're using um I know that I get really tripped up on this, uh, on the, the whole world of added sugars. Like I think I, I have a good idea of what the natural sugars are, but Andrea, help us understand, like give us a refresh on natural sugars and then just tell us a little bit about added sugars because I think those are the kind of little things that are you know lurking behind every corner that we think, oh, I didn't see the word high fructose corn syrup, so it must not have any sugar. But that's not the case, is it? Right. That's exactly right. You know, the I think the, the easiest type of sugar to define, like you were saying, is definitely the natural sugars. You know, those are the those are the, the sugars that you're gonna find in your fruits, um, some vegetables and, and dairy products. Um, you, you know, those sugars are like the ones that are in fruits and vegetables are sucrose and fructose, and then mm-hmm. the ones that are in the dairy products are, are lactose. Um, the reason why, you know, we, we try to encourage people to eat those, those types of sugars is because those, when we, when we consider something natural, 
it's that we're eating the food where that sugar is contained. It's currently contained. It's not been mm-hmm. extracted out. So you're getting all the other helpful nutrients like you know phytochemicals vitamins and minerals that actually come from the food mm-hmm. well added sugars even though some added sugars have the name sucrose and fructose that the difference is, is they have actually been removed from their plant or animal source and then they're added back to food to enhance the sweetness but the problem is is that even though it does those those added sugars provide palatability on a lot of products those are the same sugars that create health problems down the road, such you know, as such as high blood sugar. Right. They'll help. They they're responsible often for increasing triglycerides in some people who are susceptible to that. I see. And you don't get the you don't get the um, the other nutrients that you would if you were eating it in its original plant source. Um, the other thing that that I think trips people up a lot too is that sugars like honey and molasses, even though they're not refined, they're actually considered a refined sugar they are considered added by the nutrition food label laws. Mm-hmm. And they are there, it's because again, they are added to the food to enhance the sweetness. So, you know, like for example, the marinara that we were talking about before, that's gonna have a combination of natural sugars and added sugars sometimes. Mm-hmm. The natural would come from the tomatoes and then if any of those sugars were added to it, then you'd have the, you, you know, you'd have a different kind of sugar, which would be the added sugar. Got it. Got it. So I guess also the other thing to, to acknowledge is that in, in this new world of, of more detailed food labeling, the idea is not for everyone to eliminate sugar from their diets, but just to be aware of what they're, they're having, right? I mean, it's, you know, sometimes we live in a world of extremes, so I, I, I would hate for anyone to think, well, I've just got to eliminate sugar altogether because things like tomato sauce or marinara sauce, well, I guess if it's if, I, if it has a little bit of natural sweetness, that's one thing, but I guess just being cognizant of all the added sugars out there. Right, right. And, and there are some new recommendations for sugars. So, again, we don't really have to worry so much about the natural because of the health benefits and yeah. it's a great energy source. But for the added, we do want to keep those in check. And currently, the American Heart Association recommends that women limit their added sugar intake to about 24 grams, which is actually the equivalent of about six teaspoons of sugar. Mm -hmm. And then for men, the limit is 36 grams, which is about the equivalent of nine teaspoons. So Hmm. that'd be for the total. For the day. Okay. That doesn't seem quite as extreme as what I'm supposed to have in terms of salt, which is like a a little, uh, it's not even an eighth of a teaspoon. It's like the dash. Right. It's, it's even smaller. So I think I can visualize that. Um, Mary, I did want to ask you this because um, for those of you who don't know Mary's background, she is our uh, resident uh, super athlete. Um, she's completed many, many, many marathons, completed multiple full Ironmans. So Sugar and sports drinks, Mary. Uh, we know we got to stay hydrated, but um, help us understand the benefit of having drinks with some sugar or maybe artificial sweeteners. How much is enough? When is it too much? Is it more important to have the electrolytes in there or the sugar? Just because I know, I feel like, uh, it's, I mean, sports drinks are everywhere now. And I feel like you can kind of get sideways if you're going out for a workout or a run or whatever, come out of a spin class or aerobic class and, you know, you drink a giant bottle of Gatorade that's really high in sugar. You might have just given yourself back all those correct calories you just burned off in the exercising. Right. I I think with me, it depends on the event and the duration of my exercise period. If I'm doing a race like a marathon... I will just drink whatever is on the course because my body needs the sugar. But I'm not going to take eight ounces of Gatorade at every water um, aid station. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and my body needs it at that point. But during my just normal daily life, I don't drink Gatorade. I'm not putting it down, but I, you know, I drink other um, fluids mm-hmm. to replenish my... Um, electrolytes, but um, but it, it really just depends on the duration and whatever what the event is. So if I go to a a thirty minute aerobics class tonight, 
Um, do I actually need a sports drink or is water better? Water's fine. Yeah. Water's fine. Okay. So is it, do I need to start thinking about this if I'm working out, say, more than an hour? I mean, at what point is it okay? Because even when I'm working out, I take a sports drink and I dilute, dilute it, it by uh -huh. at least half That's great. with water mm -hmm. um, just so I'm getting some flavor, mm -hmm. mostly for flavor, right. but I also right. am trying to cut the sugar, right. uh, the sweetness. Yeah, and it depends too if you're if you're outside and you're sweating a lot, you yeah. might need more of the electrolytes, right. um, but diluting it's a great idea. And I think some of the sports drinks that are out there are lower in sugar, but do provide the same electrolytes that you yeah. get in the full strength. Yeah. Um, so that's usually my choice. Yeah. Um, I also have some powders at home that I mix up, and if I can have those out on the course where I'm running, um, that's even better because right. then I have control over what I'm drinking. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So another thing I wanted to ask both of you: What do you make of the this this kind of emerging world of of artificial sweeteners, or I guess they're artificial, but some of them are based on. Uh, plant-based products. I, I mean, I, I guess in my mind growing up, I thought an artificial sweetener was something that was created in a lab that was not, I mean, it may have had a, a, a at one point an origin that was from a, a plant or other sweet, natural sweet source. But now I feel like I see all these other products out there. Sometimes they come in sugar in the raw there. I mean, w help us understand the world of of artificial sweeteners. Well, I don't know about you, Mary, but I know that that for me, I, f I feel like I read the information that I read is it can be controversial. Uh -huh. You know, on one side of the coin, you have, um, you know, the idea that if you're having artificial sweeteners, then you're reducing calories, and that can help promote weight loss. Right. But then you have other emerging emerging studies that say that actually the opposite is true, that mm -hmm. it actually stimulates your brain to make you want to actually eat more. So Seriously? So that's why <laughs> after I have the diet ginger ale, um, I'm like craving a chocolate bar? That's right. That's right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And then you have the other aspect of the artificial sweeteners where, you know, there have been, there's been studies that link that to brain diseases. Uh -huh. So, you know, in, in my book, I'm kind of like Mary. I, I tend to, when I really just need something to drink, um, I skip both sweeteners and just go for water mm -hmm. most of the time. I guess you're, what you're saying is from a, a health standpoint, just be sure you know what you're getting and just double check mm -hmm. how it's made. Right, right, yeah. right. Well, it's interesting too because I think that if, like I like I was joking before, um, you know, now that I'm much more aware of my own personal health, mm -hmm. I've tried to cut back on sugars to reduce calories. But what I have found is that when I have done that, my taste buds have actually changed. And so, how so? But how so? Well, actually, when I do eat something sweet, it's much more intensified. Mm -hmm. And when I have a food that has an artificial sweetener, I pick up immediately that it's not natural. It has yeah. a distinct aftertaste. Whereas right. years prior, mm -hmm. when I was consuming those products regularly, I didn't notice it as much. Um, and I also have just found, too, that I do like sweet things. From time to time, but I also like to sometimes again use in like in actual food applications use sweeteners too to help balance the flavor just a small little bit. Um, and I you, again, you can pick up if you use something that's artificial instead of something that has maybe more flavor like a honey or a molasses mm -hmm. that actually has um, a distinct aroma or yeah. floral sure. aspect to it. Yeah, so. yeah, that that sounds good. Switching gears for a minute and going back to. Um, to gluten-free. Um, Mary, I think you have a great example of doing it out of solidarity for a family member, um, but now you're, you, you have been eating gluten-free for a long time. You feel great. Um, but I also know, or at least I, I feel like I hear, even within our um, community of um, folks that are using our gluten-free meal plan, they're coming to it for um, I mean, some of them may have celiac or have other, you know, specific allergies to gluten, but I feel like a lot of them are doing it because it just, hey, I want to eat gluten free. It'll make me feel better. I'll lose weight or I'll do whatever. I mean, help us understand what actually happens when um, someone eats a gluten free diet. First of all, if you don't mind, for those who may not know, tell us what, you know, what is gluten and then what does it mean to actually be on a gluten-free diet and can you really lose weight 
I mean, is it is it beneficial to someone to be on a gluten-free diet if they don't have a specific allergy to gluten? Great, great questions. Um, I think people are confused about what gluten is. They think it's flour, and it's really the protein in wheat. And Got it's it. also in rye and barley and, and triticale, which is a cross between wheat and rye. Mm-hmm. And and people think that, that anything that just has flour in it right. is, is gluten. I mean, like we were talking earlier about labeling. And even something like soy sauce is wheat-based. So you have to buy a gluten-free soy sauce. Right. And it's you won't necessarily see gluten in the ingredient deck. But what's great with labeling now is that it will tell you if something is either processed in a plant where gluten where gluten uh, where products are made that contain gluten right and are, or it will also have a gf on the label um, oh, there are right, some right. products that you think Got are it. just naturally gluten free like some of these microwavable rice pouches but you have to look for one that is gluten free because the rice might have also been processed in in the same plant where they do other um, grain mixes, so even be aware of that. Got because it. Because there's this thing called cross contamination. Yeah. And if somebody has gone gluten free, or even somebody with celiac disease, and they have eliminated gluten from their diet, they can be affected by something that was cross contaminated. Right. I guess I've seen that labeling for um, like nuts for people mm-hmm. who have nut allergies. Right. And sometimes I'll see hey, or this soy was processed or milk. in a plant mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. So just to confirm, rice, like a bag of just white Long rice, grain rice, is not is gluten-free. Is gluten-free is. But the pouches, you need to double check because they may have been processed in a plant right. where they were, they were processed had, with, with things that had gluten. With other, okay. with other right. Very good. Right. Um, um, when you were talking about um, losing weight, um, when you start eating a gluten-free diet, you certainly an- eliminate things from your diet. And initially, you can lose weight because you're, it's just like when on Whole30 or Paleo, you're eliminating food groups, and so you're, 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 you're um, limiting the, your food choices. Mm-hmm. But then when people have realized, oh, the cookies, the breads, the pasta, the snacks, all these things that I can have, yeah. when they start reintroducing those products back into their diet, the weight loss um, tables off. Yeah. I didn't lose weight when I went on a gluten-free diet. Right. Uh, and it's it's no guarantee that that you will lose weight. Um, the way to lose weight on a gluten-free diet is to re- is to just eat whole foods. Like, yeah. Instead. Yeah, I think that was okay, important when you pointed um, that out the first you, time. You can certainly substitute, say, gluten-free spaghetti mm-hmm. when you're making um, uh, having having dinner. Or you can use the new zoodles, or you can use um, the cauliflower rice instead of regular rice. It's going to lower your calories. So when you right. you can go the vegetable route when you when you want to substitute um, a gluten free, say a quote starch right. with, with say a sauce or yeah. um, or a side dish. So the, the I, I guess would the key takeaway here be that if you're going whether it's out of necessity or out of just choice. If you're going to start a, uh, um, a gluten-free diet, don't just run down the packaged food aisles grabbing everything that says it's gluten-free. Right, right. Because those could be loaded with things that might actually not only be not very healthy for you, but you could end up gaining more weight because of the added calories. The key would be to continue on with a whole food diet um, and eating things that are um, as close to the original source as possible. Right, and and it's it's surprising how much more expensive these gluten free products yeah. are because I love a, a couple of snacks and to spend six dollars on a bag of pretzels seems a little bit <laughs> extreme, but yeah. that's my one little splurge. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm not going out there buying cookies and crackers and and a lot of other um, of these products because they can be um, quite expensive. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. Um, I want to thank you both for taking the time out. Um, I think this was a a great um, way to connect your expertise with our um, subscribers and podcast listeners. And I hope that um, today wasn't too frightening and that you would both come back again and tackle some more of these important questions. I see you shaking your heads, but uh, we need to hear. We'd love to come back. We would definitely love to come back. Okay. You've been listening to Real Food for Real Life. 
Subscribe today and you'll never miss another episode. You'll also have access to past episodes with terrific guests ranging from cookbook authors to paleo experts, and eating experts to fitness pros. You can find us at itunes.com backslash podcast backslash real food for real life. And when you subscribe, be sure to leave us a review. You can also find us on other popular podcast apps like Stitcher and Google Play Music. If you have questions about this episode or our podcast, feel free to email me at community at emails.com or you can tweet them to me at emails using the hashtag AskEmails. To get more information on emails and our variety of meal plans, visit us at emails.com. Until next time, I'm Scott Jones. Thanks for listening.